Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Joshua Schachter. Joshua is the founder of Delicious and the inventor of tagging, which became hashtags. Joshua has founded two startups, invests in startups, runs an event for autonomous racing called Self Racing Cars, and is an amateur race car driver. Hey, Joshua, it's great to have you back. This is uh, the second or maybe third time we've had you on the show, but uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. How are you doing? It, we're Good. we're really excited to have you back because you always have some great tools. And these days, I know you're paying special attention to new stuff. So we're really eager to hear what you have for us. You've got a few tools for us. And tell us, uh, the first one is uh, intriguing, scalpels. Yeah, so... I grew up in a household where, where both of my parents went to art school and they had not gotten in the habit of using, you know, scissors to cut paper and things. You, If you wanted to cleanly cut paper, you put it down on something, on a piece of glass or something, and you use a razor blade to cut it. Um, so I grew up using razor blades instead of scissors, which is not, you know, I guess the safest thing. <laughs> um, but it's a habit I got into and, and I always noticed that that, that you know, not great scissors leave terrible edges um i i i I have been using razor blades for a long time but they are awkward to hold and difficult and hard to, to precisely get into places so um i discovered not too long ago disposable scalpels and you know it's like you know $15. $15. They last for quite a long time. I'm not very tough on them. Um, there's various shapes. Um, they're super useful for uh, uh, cleaning up 3D prints and cutting things precisely. Um, they are wickedly sharp. Um, I, I, When they finally do go, and they can crack um, because they're not that tough, uh, I put a piece of tape over them so no one gets cut when they go into the garbage. Um, and I recently actually built a, uh, a paper cutter. Um, I, uh, I built a, uh, basically a CNC machine to do, uh, uh, very large drawings. And, uh, I had gotten a roll of 48 inch wide watercolor paper. I think it's 42 inch wide watercolor paper. And then I realized that a, uh, a guillotine paper cutter was going to be like $1,500 for an okay one. <laughs> so I bought a piece of linear guide um which is a, a a steel rail designed to have a ball bearing pack slide on it and 3d printed a scalpel holder uh so now i have a thing that will cut use a scalpel and cut a perfectly straight line in a piece of paper you know it can go 60 inches but i only need the 42 inches huh. so um, so in in your i'm um, using a disposable scalpels i think there's a well is there is there a brand or a type that you recommend over others? I, I imagine there would be some that would be kind of like an exacto knife where you're just replacing the blades and the handle stays the same. There's others where probably you dispose the whole thing, blade and handle. Do you have any recommendations on that? I use the ones that are whatever the cheapest thing on Amazon is. I use, I think, number 11s. And there's another one. One has got a sharp blade that looks a lot like an exacto knife. Um, one uses a, one's got a rounded blade, so it cuts everywhere, um, at, at a variety of angles. Which one I, do you prefer? I like the sharp one, but, but I am, to- I, I actually read some medical catalogs and, um, uh, I think people generally like the rounded one. Um, but there are many types, hooks and all kinds of things that seem super useful and I haven't gotten into it, but I plan to. Um, but I, I, I find myself reaching for, like, I've gone through many packages of, uh, uh, of the straight bladed ones. I use ones where it's got an integrated handle, um, because I know that I would probably just lose the handle, um, at some point, but, um, probably there are probably nicer ones than the ones I use. Okay. So they appear to be, you know, I don't know. They probably run around seven or $8 for 10 of them. Yeah. Um, think of them as a buck a piece. Um, number 11's um, plastic handles. Uh, 
That's the straight edge. And I guess the difference between a, scap a scapel and like an exacto is that the angle of the blade. So exacto is a little bit closer to, I don't know, perpendicular, say, and there's a higher rake on a scapel edge. It's also thinner. It's uh -huh. a much finer um, blade. Um, mm -hmm. I Yes, I use number 11s mostly, and then it looks like I ordered some number 22s once. Okay. And it looks like you can get, if you're just interested in the blades, you can get them like 100 blades for 15 bucks. Yes. I, I have not tried I have not tried that yet, though. I, I, I get the sense that the individual ones are higher quality, but these the ones that I've been using have been perfectly adequate. And um, is strong, you mentioned the blade's thinner, so is this strong enough for cutting like spurs on a piece of plastic or? Um, yeah, yeah. If they're not that fine. If you if you put a lot of sideways force, they can snap. Um, you know, you have to remember that in in steel, uh, there is a trade off between brittleness and sharp uh, sharpness, or sh you know, sharp ability. Sure, the brittleness of it. Yeah, um, yeah. and these scaffolds just just I'm just trying to figure out the numbering system. Is it like is it sort of where the higher the number the smaller finer no um um because they have like, is a number 22 bigger or smaller than a number 11 uh it is actually slightly bigger um if you google for scalpel shapes there are guides for example um uh, a 22 is rounded a number 12 is hooked um a 12 d has blades on two sides so there's oh, all kinds of different like things Okay. Yeah. Uh, it well, it's it's got a hook with a blade on the outside and the inside. Um, there's little tiny ones. There's gigantic ones. There's all sorts of different types. Uh, I, I I feel like the next one I'm going to try is the one with a hook, um, so I can sort of grab something and pull back. Yeah. But I haven't yeah. really needed it. Okay. Well, that's a cool tool. I never thought about it, but um, yeah. it, might, it may be um, better than an exacto for certain jobs. Um, certainly, yeah. the thing about people don't realize about paper, if you cut a lot of paper or foam core, is that it really does dull blades very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, you really have to have them really sharp to do a clean cut on things like foam core. Yeah, fo well... Uh... If you talk to anyone who does a lot of like making stuff in the shop, um, they will have a war story about cutting foam. So I like when I, I actually use the um, scalpels to cut foam a lot because you can just sort of gently, it is so sharp, you could just gently run it over several times and it just cuts a little bit more each time. Like it really does go through stuff very easily. It feels to me like they are sharper than exacto knives. Actually, the one something I learned recently is if you have a good a blade on your saw, you can use saw uh, your table saw to cut foam core. Interesting. I I do not have a table saw oh. at all. Okay. Um, I get by without. Um, I suppose I have a friend that has one. He has a saw stop at his shop. Um, I I have a lot of trouble mitigating um, uh, sawdust because my cars live with the stuff. And uh, so I tend to do in, in paper and 3D printing, and then I go directly to metal. I don't do very much wood. Mm -hmm. um, so I well, never if you got do have, that. If you do have a table saw, you can cut foam core on it, which is really nice if you're cutting a lot to the similar width or whatever. Um, yes. You can send it through really fast. So um, great. Scapples, disposable scapples for cutting materials. Um, what's another cool tool, Josh? Okay, so tell us about threaded inserts. So I, I've been using them a ton, uh, a lot lately. A threaded insert is basically a uh, a plug with a screw hole in the middle of it. Um, a plug with a screw hole in the middle of it. Okay, something you put in a hole, and inside that is uh, something you can screw into. Correct. So I use... And there are many kinds. Uh, I use M5. I try to standardize on M5 uh, bolts and things for my projects. Um, so I have, uh, they're, they're, they're about, uh, I think, nine millimeters long. Six and a half millimeters is the hole that they fit into. Um, and M5 got, is metric? It's a metric bolt? Metric, M5 bolt, yes, a metric five okay. millimeter bolt. 
All right. So and the five millimeters is the what is what is five millimeters? Um, it's the it's the diameter of the bolt. Okay. It's the nominal diameter. A real M5 bolt is slightly less than that. Okay. Um, anyway, so it, it's a it's a cylinder about six and a half millimeters in diameter, about ten millimeters long. It's got a it, I use brass ones. They've got a knurled outside and a threaded inside, right? Thus a threaded insert. So what I do is when I 3D print something, I leave a 6.5 millimeter hole where I want the bolt hole to be, and then when it's time to put together, I put a uh, I just take this. I I put the um, the threaded insert on the tip of a soldering iron, um, and I I just push it into the hole, um, and it lines up and pops in, and now I have a brass threaded slot in my 3D print. That's right, because so it's like a heat press fit. You kind of that is exactly it. However, there are ones that have um, external threads so that you can screw them in. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, uh, on a CNC table that I made, um, or CNC router table, I drilled holes and then I screwed in um, brass threaded inserts. Uh, and it was nice because they were brass on that machine because uh, a um, the brass is safe for a uh, a carbide bit to touch. So, so I'm a little confused about screwing in an insert. If you're screwing in the insert, why don't you just screw in the the thing? So, so this is this is this is so this is not the 3D printed one. The 3D printed one is is knurled. It's got a just a pattern to grip the melted plastic. Um, you, you obviously can't put, uh, do a thermal set in a uh, in in wood, right? So the outer side is um, threaded, and then it's got a smaller size on the inside that is threaded. Um, and it lets you bolt and unbolt things to the table. So I did a grid of, uh, I believe it was 10 by 10 or maybe more than that. I, I put like a hundred threaded inserts into this piece of plywood, and then I could bolt down anything I wanted and then unbolt it, rebolt it, right? Because the brass is going to survive the threading and unthreading for a long time. Okay. And there seems to be a whole bunch of different kinds of threaded inserts. There's, I mean, um, there's... Press fit, thermal fit. Right. There's dozens and dozens of kinds. Different kinds of threads on the outside. Do you? What's your experience? You mentioned the thermal fit, um, which would be probably good into plastic. If you're going into plywood, you would use one of these... The, the threaded wood. outsides, ones that's designed right. for wood. There's... And they have different types as well um, yeah. on the outside. And, and the other, so with plastic, you can, like, say I wanted to screw one piece into a 3D printed thing, right? I wanted the, the bolt to sink into that. I could um, 3D print a 4.5 millimeter hole and then use a tap and tap a hole as if it was metal or something. And that will work, but it's not particularly strong. Um, you can't bolt it and unbolt it and rebolt it and try it again and do that. Um, so it's basically, it makes for tougher, stronger things that can be reused, reorganized, realigned. So for example, um, on the, uh, on the thing that I mentioned before, the, the, the linear guide, the cutter, um, it's got a rotating bearing. So the, um, so that the scalpel can rotate, but the, the, the scalpel mount itself, um, is actually bolted to with these threaded inserts. And I believe I used 12 threaded inserts in this whole design. Um, so everything could be open, taken apart, moved, replaced, fixed, because, you know, I rarely get the design right the first time. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, five or six right. times you screw something and unscrew it in a, uh, uh, into a, a raw plastic hole, it comes apart, it breaks. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, I mean, in, in some senses, this is what IKEA does with their flat furniture. There, there's actually their inserts. Yes, that you are. Those, those are usually not. They are threaded, right? That you know, you'll you'll put a. It's like a cylindrical um, thing with it with with the hole in the opposite side, and then it 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 um, sinks into a larger hole, and then you screw into it laterally, right? This is that same kind of idea. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you're making uh, rearrangeable furniture or portable disassembled furniture, you can also use this. So, so um, the brass ones will obviously um, uh, last a little longer and be be nicer, but they make cheap, cheap versions for plywood, etc. 
Um, so, th so this is just a general tool. There's not a specific brand or kind that you're going to suggest. The good stuff is they're called PEMs, P-E-M. So P -E -M. And sometimes people refer to them as PEM. Is that a brand or? A I believe that's a brand. Yeah. Okay. Um, I get these from McMaster, so I'm assuming they're they're pretty good. So I don't, but I don't, you know, they they obscure the the underlying brand on lots of their stuff. Right. The the PEM ones have a kind of a diamond neural on the outside. Yeah, that's the thermal thermoset. Right. Pattern. I believe they have many kinds though. Okay. I yeah, I believe they're a company that makes lots and lots of types of this stuff. Alrighty. Okay. Well, good. Pem pressin thermoset threaded inserts. Threaded inserts. Check them out. Um, so, um, what's another another one on your list? The next one here is the slim scrapbooking project cases. Mm, that's intriguing. Tell us about that. So, this is an organizational thing that I use. Um, basically, if I'm working on a circuit board, like an Arduino with a sensor and the, the whatever, like there's eight parts and three tools and whatever. I I found these boxes, they're, they're like a foot wide, a foot deep and like two or three inches tall. So they're not huge. Uh, and I put all the stuff in the project case together. And what happens is when I have to swap to another project, you know, I get blocked on this project, I'm waiting for a part. I can just close the thing up, put it on the shelf, um, you know, many of my projects are small enough to fit in that. Um, I, I do have larger bins for bigger projects, but but I have dozens of these. Um, I like, for example, one that's sitting out on my desk right now is um, I'm building uh, 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 a sensor mesh for my house, ESP uh, 8266s and temperature probes. Um, so all of them fit in the box. There's the the wall warts that go with them. That the uh, apparently fake Dallas semiconductor um, temperature sensors, um, and it all fits in there, and it lets me keep everything together. And I will frequently just put, like, if it's especially if I'm using a special tool or something, I'll just put the tools in the box with it directly. Um, so that means that when I want to pick up a project, everything is already organized and put together in one spot. So I don't spend a lot of time, you know gathering the pieces to work on something working on it and then scattering the pieces when i when i have to stop working on it that's such a great idea i love that do you have a your, your description on the documents kind of generic do you have a particular source where you get these i got like two dozen of them at michael's and i have no idea oh, okay. what the brand is okay um, but it's just a generic uh you know polyethylene storage box the only downside that you have to be careful of is static if you're dealing with electronic stuff mm -hmm. but i have i have one that has like i do um every year i send out christmas cards and i make christmas cards like i will uh usually i cnc route or laser cut the card and then I stamp it. So all the ink, the paper, the stationery, the rolling tools are in one of these boxes. Oh, so you keep the tool in the project. And what what, what size? What's the general dimension of that you kind of find works? I mean, I assume that you have a kind of a set where there's um, they're all the same size, so they can stack or whatever. Um, yeah, they're they're um they're the size of a big binder. They can hold a big binder inside them. You know, it's like for scrapbooking, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm not actually sure exactly what scrapbooking is, other than you know, occasional mentions. But I mean, it's so there are the rough, the rough size and dimensions of a three-ring binder. Yeah, a little bit larger. They can they can hold one. Okay. I think I found them online. Yeah, I, I see they stack, and uh, they're perfect for like an Arduino and components. And they're called scrapbook cases. Yeah, they're slim, uh, slim storage cases, yeah. slim scrapbooking. Um, so actually, I see some, I see some at Home Depot, unbelievably called portable scrapbook case, twelve by twelve. Yeah, it's a thing. Accommodates eight point five by eleven inch paper and folders, so uh -huh. it's twelve by thirteen and then one point six inches high. So that's a, yeah, the, that's the, the thing. I, Iris USA Slim one on Amazon yeah, is the one right. you're looking at. Yeah, or yeah, that's very Home similar Depot. to what I use. Um, I have smaller ones. I have. Um, you know, that aren't called scrapbooking cases, but um, I, I mean, I have multiple sizes. Uh, I, I, I do a lot of, you know, organizing and putting things away because what happens is I'll, I'll have, like I have one large crate 
that says M5 on it. It's got, you know, 12 kinds of M5 bolts in it, M5 nuts, the M5, you know, th you know, I, I try to organize everything um, by the most specific part of its nature, right? The thing you mo might think of it, right? So there's, you know, something that might have a, an M5 nut, but is, is actually for doing a USB thing might go in US, you know, whatever the most special feature is, I put it together. But like all the M5 um, inserts are in with the M5s. There's there's a, a small bag of M5 um, taps, uh, 4.5 millimeter drills, 5.1, you know, for making the taps, 5.1 millimeter drills for making, um, you know, loose fit right. holes so for the like, M5. like a kit, like this is like your M5 kit. Right, and I have an M5 box, an M6 box. There's an M8 right, box. Right. There's a right. printing box, etc. You know, USB centers. Yeah, the, your idea, which I had not thought of before, of having a project box where things, where it's not just the materials or the project in its current stage, but the tools, the specific ones, they're all lived together in one happy house. That's that's interesting. And, and and sometimes that means I need to have multiple sets of tools, especially right. for inexpensive tools. Right. Um, but if it's a specific tool that, that I needed to work with, like, so for example, um, the Arduino programmer might go live in there. You know, I, I don't, there's no Arduino programmer, but like, uh, like my STM32 programmer might go in with the project that's using it for now. And I'll have two or three of them if it's, you know, if it's that important. Right. Um, yeah. Because I, I find I spend more time looking for the stuff than I do working on the stuff. Yeah, exactly. Okay, this is great. Okay, so um, your fourth pick, um, in some ways, is kind of well known, but maybe you have something different for us: the McMaster Car Catalog. What? Tell us about that. So McMaster Car is one of several large, um, I guess, uh, mechanical parts. Companies. It's like a hardware store, the ultimate it, it's like, hardware store. It's like the hardware store, right? They right. have, they have everything, and it's like literally the best e-commerce site I've ever ever seen. Um, plus education on everything, right? So, like, there's a plastic section, and they will tell you, you know, this this plastic has you know good durability but poor machinability, and this one will melt at whatever. Um, and it was actually kind of uh, – there is a physical catalog, but I, I don't have one. I, I go online. And um, it, it was almost the kind of the inspiration for uh, the wheelhouse mailing list that I run, which is like about 60% of the time I'll talk to a, you know, a, a very uh, active maker, and they've never heard of this. And, uh, and I'm like, H how do you survive? You know, how do you – you know – like I will frequently go like I I will measure a thing and I'm like okay I need an M5 bolt black steel 13 millimeters long and I'll go look on McMahon. ah there's one order it it'll be here you know tomorrow or the next day they're not cheap right but and, and, the, and the thing that I will interject is that um that they have everything and they have a very good description of it the technical the dimensions you know the boiling point whatever it is all the specs are there and they're it's it's very very clear um there's a cad tool there's a there, CAD sorry, there's tool. cad drawing there's right. a uh, an stl download you can get a 3d model of the thing and stuff it into your 3d model and see if it will fit um you know i, I the problem is that they are often expensive on lots of things that don't need to be. Um, so, um, you know, I will still go to Amazon a lot, of, you know, for, for bolts or whatever, it's fine. But for like really expensive, you know, things like, for example, the linear rail I bought, like, I assume that the McMaster is carrying the good stuff, which is in dollars per millimeter or whatever. Um, and I did not need the good stuff. So I went on Amazon and got something cheap. I probably could have gone on AliExpress and got something even cheaper. Um, so, but the other the other thing that I use McMaster for a lot is like, I don't know what the th and this is the search problem in general, right? I don't. I'm so uneducated. I don't know what even the name of the thing that might solve right. Right. the problem right. is. So I will just sort right. of type stuff that's sort of related to the problem into the search box. So it's just like, you know, clips. 
you know, grabby clips, you know, long clips, you know, et cetera. And you will get stuff. It will try. Um, and you will often just, you know, it, because you know, it's all sort of decent, right? That's the problem with Amazon is like, it's, it's that plus whatever someone key, you know, keyword stuffed into some random thing, right? If you ask for something sufficiently weird or obscure, you just get like t-shirts. Right. And this is the, if you can, so so all this is online right now and searchable, but for many years and most of his life, the, the catalog was a physical catalog and it's a brick of a catalog. It's like thousands of pages thick. I mean, literally thousands of pages. It's, it's, it's about the size of a shoebox or a shoebox. And I believe you had to buy it. And you had to buy it. It's hundreds of dollars unless you were, uh, you know, a customer that was ordering, you know, daily or weekly. Um, however, these don't go out of date that fast. And so what I recommend is that you find someone with a slightly old catalog who is subscribing basically to it and get one of them because with this, because of the way it's organized, you can flip through it and you can um, browse and actually search for what you're looking for a little easier than trying to just put random things in the search um, box. So it's 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 a the paper one is a little bit better for hunting for something that you don't know what it's called but you kind of can guess where it might live in the taxonomy of things and so um, I use that I have a, a paper version that I got from an old version from someone who has a, had had a shelf of them and so seek out someone like that and get a paper version just to browse occasionally. Maybe we can check eBay and see. Even even on eBay, they're like fifty bucks, I think. Yeah, look at that. Old ones too. Yeah, it's old amazing. ones for fifty bucks. Um, yeah. And then the other thing that's great about them is that they they ship quickly, so you'll have what you need, you know, right. fairly the rapidly. One little caveat from that is they won't tell you what the shipping costs are because they just bill you for the actual shipping costs, so you don't find out until afterwards. But they're you know. They're honorable about it, um, yeah. but they won't, unlike Amazon, they won't tell you what shipping costs are beforehand. They're a very secretive company. Oh, yeah? Yeah, they won't let anybody take a look at their warehouse or anything. Like fans have come to like want to check it out. Um, I think I think we might have talked to Luke Canlian about it, the guy that works at uh, Applied Inventions, mm -hmm. and he tried to go there, and they're like, yeah, no, yeah. no one, no one looks inside our place. <laughs> Okay. It's got it's got to be an incredible operation. I mean, just a, just the sheer number of SKUs that they have. Yeah, because they literally have every variation, I'd say, of a bolt, a bolt size. If if anybody makes it, they probably carry it. Um, if you look at the sizes of bearings or whatever it is, it's just astounding. Because it, and in all every metal and every kind of plated metal and every version of the diameter and the length, and it's um, it's amazing. One of the things I'm hoping to do someday on on Wheelhouse is actually do a sort of more thorough search of interesting catalogs. Yeah. Um, there are, you know, I mean, it, it as amazing it is it as as they are, McMaster is sort of very base level stuff. Um, so, for example, uh, I needed um, pulleys to fix something, and they didn't have the right thing, and I went to SDPSI. Um, their McMaster is often a bit, you know, a bit behind on on um, um, on metric things. So th there are other, you know, there are other companies. So it's like Misumi has great stuff too, but their, their website is still very good, but it, it's also baffling, right? Like you have to figure out, they give you a diagram to show, figure out the part number of the thing that you want. And you have to sort of figure that out by hand. Yeah. It doesn't um, work. So let's talk about Wheelhouse a little bit, um, Josh, in our remaining time. Yeah, we're so excited about Wheelhouse. For, for, yeah. But, but tell uh, people who don't know what it is, what it is. So Wheelhouse is a mailing list uh, at wheelhouse.substack.com uh, that is basically three or four um, things that you might add to your repertoire um, as a maker, right? So it's a new material it's a new kind of tool or it's a new kind of technique. Um, and the idea is that there's some reasonable chance that no one's ever heard of this before, um, or you've never heard of it rather. Um, 
So, for example, uh, a couple weeks ago, I saw a YouTube video about um, that you can cause um, you can cause uh, silicone molds to grow or shrink with the application of mineral oil. So you can actually wow. scale 3D parts, right? So if you wanna if you wanna make something become larger or become you know scaled up or down, and I was just like you know, holy crap, that seems very useful, right? That's a thing yeah. that I can, and then you, you put that in your pocket for later. And then this is a new kind of screwdriver and you put that in your pocket for later. Right, so right. it's basically, or, or, or yeah. 3D printing on fabric. Yeah. Um, I've seen some interest from uh, 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 guest hosts. So other people have come in and, and done three or four items. So Spencer Wright from uh, uh, The Prepared did one. Um, uh, which was a lot of fun, and and I have another one coming up. So it's every one to two weeks, or basically, basically as my anxiety builds about having not sent one out lately, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I do another one. Right. And, and I, I think what it is is it's a, a little bit of a reflection of the accelerated rate of learning in this sort of maker community, often propelled by by YouTube, um, where people are being very very innovative in you know, making new tools, finding new uses for new tools, um, taking maybe materials that were for prof professionals and then kind of bringing them to the amateurs. Uh, it's 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 kind of, of all the newsletters and places I've seen, maybe even more than Make Magazine, really into sort of what is the leading edge of a, a kind of the maker materials, techniques, and... Um, uh, Josh is doing a great job. You're doing a great job of kind of bringing that forward. I mean, and on top of that, there's also, um, I try to get, you know, cross pollination from other communities. I mean, I was watching a video about a, a, uh, a cosplay costume build and, um, it was, a, a camp camu I cam camu -I, I don't know how to pronounce it, but she glued two pieces of foam together and then just sanded it down with like sand. And I'm like, it never would have occurred to me that you could use sandpaper on foam to, to clean it up. And it worked fine. And I'm like, okay, well, crap, that's going in my, my, um, you know, and then, and then there were like four more in the same video. Like she made a model of her herself by, by wrapping herself in saran wrap, then covering that in, um, duct tape and then cutting it off mm. and and had a wow. like a 3d like i'm like <laughs> okay well you know that seems useful for cosplay but you could probably use that for other things for like yeah, yeah, awkward yeah. shapes or making carbon fiber parts or whatever um uh i found one in a a vintage computer uh restoration thing and it was basically they used um baking soda and uh uh crazy glue cyanoacrylate glue and basically um you put a little bit of glue on and then you put the uh the powder on and it solidifies to to rock hard instantly and then you can but it's it's not so tough that you can't just file it down so they basically restored like a commodore 64 part and painted it and i'm like crap that seems useful yeah that's really cool i've used that too yeah, or even the uh, yeah, I was just thinking of the re restoration guys and the tricks of using um, hydrogen peroxide to bleach back the original colors. It's just yeah. So there's there's a whole bunch of innovation and um, really fantastic inventiveness happening in this world. And uh, Wheelhouse is is a newsletter trying to um, gather some of that uh, information. And you're doing a great job. Thank you. Um, so uh, where, besides Wheelhouse, is this is that the place people can follow you best? You are on Twitter too, right? I'm 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 Joshu J O S H U on Twitter, um, but I I mostly post about plotter drawings and stupid humor. <laughs> <laughs> nothing nothing incredibly revelatory. I do talk about the the Wheelhouse stuff there too. Cool. Well, well, Joshua, this has been great chatting with you and catching up with you. Uh, we didn't even get a chance to talk about uh, uh, car racing, but we'll have you on again, and we will yeah. have you Sounds talk great. about that. Thanks so much. We'll do that one at Thank the you. racetrack. Oh, <laughs> right. Cool. Okay.
Hey everybody, it's Mark from the Cool Tools Podcast. I want to thank you for being a listener to Cool Tools. And I also would like to let you know about our Patreon page. If you would like to support the Cool Tools show, as well as our video channel, the website, and all the newsletters that we do, you can go to patreon.com slash cool tools. That's just one word, cool tools, and pledge any amount you want. You could even pledge a dollar a month. Every little bit helps. We have editors, we pay for transcribing costs, we pay our reviewers. Every bit of money that you contribute goes towards supporting the show. I'd like to give a shout out to our supporters of the Cool Tools podcast. This week, I'd like to thank the following Patreon supporters. Bill Schuler, Bob Kay, Ryan Pelly, Carl D. Patterson, Chad Cosby, Chris Wieland, Chris Weirstook, Craig Tooker, Dan O'Brien, Dean Putney, Danell Cunningham, Evan Barker, Graham Medlin, Hans Riesbeck, Helen Hegedus, Jerry Kearns, Jim Lesko, Jim Spofford, John Pollock, John Burdenbau, Keith O, Ken Altman, Les Howard, Lauren Bast, Mock Nerd, Malton Make, Mark Goebel, Matt Gromes, Michael Douglas, Michael Jones, and Michael Pecorini. Thanks to all of you for supporting the Cool Tools Show. We really appreciate it. <laughs>